Hey folks, today I want to show you two cool things. The first is an instrumented nose cone, and the second is another revision of my camera spinner idea to stabilize footage from a spinning rocket. Before we get started, this video is sponsored by Protolabs. As a general rule, when things go fast, they get hot, and the faster they go, the hotter they get. The SR-71 going Mach 3 reached over 600 degrees Fahrenheit, and when a capsule like Crew Dragon returns from low Earth orbit, it screams in at 17,000 miles per hour getting up to 3,500 degrees Fahrenheit. I have this idea that I've wanted to do for a little while, and I've been calling it the meat rocket, but maybe we should give it a different name, something like high stakes. The idea is that by going fast, we could cook a piece of meat. I want to take a thin slice of meat, stick it inside the nose cone, and as the rocket accelerates up to about Mach 3, the meat cooks because of the aerothermal heating at the tip. A big question here is how much heat actually gets transferred into the food? How do you reliably cook cook this piece of meat and like know that you're going to cook it? This is a difficult question to answer accurately. Modeling the heat transfer through a complex shape between the heat on the outside wall and the cooler inside wall is a question that usually gets answered with something like CFT. That's all well and good, but hear me out. You could also just fly it. You could just send it. Like literally, you could just send it unsend it to the rocket behind me. So here's the idea. We're gonna take this existing rocket, stick a new nose cone on it, we're gonna send it to about Mach 1, and then just see what happens. The nose cone from Send It has this aluminum tip that screws on. We don't need it, we're getting rid of it. We're actually gonna chop off more of that nose cone than the piece of aluminum, and here's why. To record temperature data, we're gonna use the AVA flight computer that flies on basically all of my rockets at this point. I've actually got it right here. We're gonna put the AVA flight computer just below the nose cone to keep all of the wiring pretty compact. So in order to get this setup to fit, AVA has to slide down through the top of the rocket, and we need just enough clearance on the top for that to happen. This whole setup ends up getting mounted on a threaded rod, which will get screwed in at the bottom of the nose cone. Cone. To make the tip, I worked from 6061 aluminum stock material, first milling off a good chunk on the CNC, then turning down the rest of the shape on the lathe. While this is going on, let me tell you about the idea behind this design. The shape of this part has a thick section up top, a thin wall down the side, and a thick section on the bottom. The idea is that in the final iteration, we'd place a piece of meat inside that thin section of wall on the side. The wall thickness here is roughly one millimeter, so hopefully we get a bit of heat transfer inside of that thin piece. If you want a more detailed look at what it took to make this nose cone, I posted a much longer version of this on my second channel, which is linked down below. So I've got four of these little thermocouples here. These are temperature sensors, basically. We're going to place them at different parts on the nose cone, and this first one is going to go at the very, very tip of the rocket. And we're going to do that in a somewhat odd way. I left the tip off of this aluminum part, and we're going to finish that top part with a slug of rocket epoxy and then embed the thermocouple at that tip. This lets us run the wire through the nose cone a little more easily. So what I did is I shaped the epoxy using a bit of painter's tape. And then once it had cured, I sanded down the shape of the tip on the lathe. This leaves the thermocouple to be the actual leading point of the rocket, so it should theoretically see the most heating. Next up, I wanted a thermocouple just a bit to the aft of the nose tip, but still exposed to the air outside. This data would have been cool to see, but the thermocouple didn't end up working. Uh, the amplifier for it died like right before the launch and it was time to to fly anyway, so we'll never know what that saw. I then added a thermocouple that was flush with the sidewall to estimate the heating we'd see on the actual skin of that thin section. And to round it out, I added a fourth thermocouple on the inside of that one millimeter thick wall. The fourth one was attached to the wall using thermal paste and then held in place using five minute epoxy. Before we keep going on any of this though, I'd like to tell you about today's sponsor, Protolabs. If you haven't heard of them before, Protolabs is the fastest and easiest way to get parts manufactured that you don't have the time or ability to make yourself. Every now and then, I have a part that I need to make where I don't have the machine or I just don't have the time to make it happen. And so getting parts 3D printed, CNC'd, or even injected molded by Protolabs is the right call. Protolabs... Proto... Protolabs's platform gives you the ultimate user experience with a streamlined quoting system and design analysis delivered right away. All you need to do is upload your CAD file, choose your manufacturing service, and Protolabs will do the work of a design for manufacture analysis, which saves you valuable time by identifying issues before they happen. They've got fabrication services that can be done in as fast as a single day turnaround. And so if you want to learn more about Protolabs's 
services, you can check them out using the link in the description down below. Thank you very much to Protolabs for sponsoring today's video, and now let's get back to it. Now that we've got our thermocouples inside the nose cone, it's time to read from them and record that data. Like I said earlier, we're going to use one of my Ava flight computers to record this data, but the computer here can't do that directly from the thermocouples. In between Ava and the sensor, we need something called an amplifier. The amplifier is going to take the signal, boost it up a bunch, make it a lot easier for Ava to read, and then Ava can record it. In addition, because of the way that thermocouples are, they do this super annoying thing where you can't solder them to anything. So instead of doing that, I tossed a bunch of those Wago lever connectors on the back of the computer sled to attach each thermocouple to its amplifier. The good news about this is that it makes it a lot easier to swap temperature sensors in and out or different amplifiers in and out, but they are pretty bulky for something this scale. This is not the actual meat cooking nose cone, by the way. This is a prototype to just measure temperature, but if we wanted to fly this on different flights or different flight profiles, those Wago lever nut connectors allow us to do that a lot more easily. Finally, I tossed a small 600 milliamp hour LiPo battery on here, and then a telemetry radio to keep track of the state of the rocket as it flew, and this turned out to work against me a little bit. On the first flight of this nose cone back in November, the telemetry radio needed so much power that we ran out of battery while the rocket was idling on the launch pad. It flew without a problem anyway, since the computer in charge of the parachutes was fine, and the goal was really to test that camera spinner device, but we never got any good data from the temperature sensors. So on this flight, I removed the telemetry radio to save power and we headed out to the launch site. Before we get to the launch though, this flight also tested version two of the camera spinner. If you remember a few months back, when I first flew this thing, the goal was to spin the cameras around to cancel out the rotation that rockets normally experience. It worked all right on the first try, but the motion was obviously jerky and could use some improvement. So in this version, I first removed the massive gear train, which was covered in sand, the brushless motor, and the external gear on the central tube. Instead of those things, I swapped them out with a stepper motor, which has much smoother motion and more controllability than the motor I was using. Instead of mounting this stepper motor on the spinning part of the ring where space is at a hyper premium, I mounted the stepper motor inside of the central tube and connected the motion of the motor with the motion of the wheel with magnets. I am so stoked about this solution. I love magnets. I stacked a bunch of these neodymium magnets on the shaft of the stepper motor inside and then a stack of them covered in epoxy to hold them on the outside on the spinning part of the wheel. When the motor rotates, the attraction of the magnet stacks keeps them roughly aligned. To control the stepper motor, I put a little computer down below the spinning section and started hooking it all together. The setup needs a computer, an IMU, a stepper motor driver, and a battery. Space is at such a premium on the scale of a four inch rocket like this that I actually had to cut the lithium polymer battery open. I took an existing three cell LiPo and cut it open to keep it from scraping against the inside of the rocket. And this actually led to some jerky motion later on, you'll see. Mounting this new setup inside of the rocket was a bit of a challenge too. Last time we were able to use that massive threaded rod that ran through the central tube and compress it in order to keep the sections attached. But because that stepper motor is inside the tube, we can't do that anymore. I had to take the top and bottom couplers, then drill pass-through holes for the screws to attach the couplers to that central tube. This setup is less rigid and stable than before, but the smooth motion from the stepper motor should make it worth it. And speaking of motion, here's a little bit of testing on the setup once it started working. Before the flight, I wanted to test the rotation of the spinner. Last time I did this using my lathe, mounting this sideways, but instead of the lathe, I wanted something with a smoother transient from no rotation to fast rotation. I was able to do this using my record player, actually, and it worked pretty well. After a decent amount of tuning, I got it to work smoothly from slow speeds to high speeds using a sort of two-mode control system. This is the final test of the spinner before flight. All right, so it's slow speeds. All we're trying to do is maintain position. And we do an all right job at that, I think. But we switch between position control and angular rate control. And they're a little bit different. Having the two different modes allows us to prioritize different things at different parts of the flight. When we're at Apogee and the vehicle is rotating like this, we want the smoothest motion we can get. And that's what this position control mode allows for. But when we're spinning really fast, 
what we're trying to just focus on is angular rate. And sometimes you can see it skips, it's not perfect. We're also getting offset on the record player. But as the vehicle slows down, we move back into position control and we try to hold the cameras in the same spot. So I'm pretty comfortable with this. I'm gonna turn it off so I don't waste the battery too much. Let's recharge everything, get this thing integrated, ready for flight, and try it out. Yeah, we're looking at this thing going about 4,000 meters. In five, four, three, two, one, The flight went straight up to an apogee of 4 kilometers with a maximum speed of 362 meters per second or just over Mach 1. The camera spinner worked better this time. Still not perfect, something happened after launch and we lost control for a few seconds, but once it re-engaged, it was super smooth till Apogee. You can actually see how close the tolerance is with that battery as the device spins around. When I make a third version of this, having much more detailed CAD is going to help eliminate these problems. Overall, I am really pleased with the shots that I got here, and I am excited to make another version of this thing at some point. If you want to see the raw footage from this camera spinner, um, I've posted it on the BPS Shorts channel, which is also linked down below. And now to answer the big question, how hot does the tip of a rocket get? Well, at Mach 1.05, the tip got up to 136 degrees Fahrenheit. Not too bad since the outside temperature on the day was about 50 degrees Fahrenheit. I was not really expecting that much of a temperature rise from such a low Mach number. The other thermocouples fared as you might expect as well. As the vehicle speeds up, we get a peak heating of about 90 degrees Fahrenheit from the thermocouple that's flush with the wall of that nose cone. And this happens at about the same time as peak heating on the tip of the nose. As for the inside wall thermocouple, we do see heat transferring to the inside of the nose cone, but you can tell that the heat pulse moves more slowly through that wall because we don't reach peak heating until about six seconds after peak heating from the tip and the wall flush sensors. And because of the thermal mass of the nose cone itself, that heat is solidly lower than the wall flush sensor or the tip sensor, going from about 45 degrees Fahrenheit to 57. Obviously, these speeds are a lot slower than the Mach 3 rocket that I want to cook meat with. That said, this design tells me it's probably worth trying a new design for whatever we end up cooking this piece of meat with, and I would love some help on this. The goal is that we need to train transfer as much thermal energy into that thin slice of meat as possible, and we have to do it without A, affecting the aerodynamics of the rocket too much. When you get up to high Mach numbers, you're really concerned about the oblique shock, shading basically your stability on the way up, and B, the piece of meat can't fall apart. Meat is relatively delicate when compared with aluminum, and so if we expose the piece of meat to the free flow airstream, it's just going to strip away. I'd love to hear any ideas that you have about how this might work or how you might approach this, and if you want to scale sketch out a diagram or draw something and tweet it to me at Joe Barnard on Twitter, I would love to take a look. It'd be great to crowdsource some type of design here so that in the name of science, we may cook a small piece of meat as inefficiently as possible. Thanks for watching. Thanks again to Protolabs for sponsoring this video and to the patrons who make this project possible. My name is Joe Barnard. May your skies be blue and your winds be low.